So I was in the store the other day and I was there to get some CO2 cartridges for my soda stream. It was this one specific thing that I really needed and they were sold out. So in the old days, that would have meant I would have got on the phone and I would have started calling around to all the different stores in my area, finding out who had it in stock. But today, just pull out my phone, I make the order right on the phone and it's gonna be shipped to my house. It's hybrid shopping and it's now more integral to our lives than it's ever been, especially with the pandemic. And to support all these new online orders that we're making, retailers are demanding more and more industrial real estate. So here's the question. Can we turn empty retail boxes into industrial ones? Well, I've got guests today that are gonna join us to answer that very question. And the short answer is yes, you can do it, but it gets pretty complicated. <laughs> Welcome to Where We Buy. It's the show where we talk with retail experts and we visit the places where we buy. My name is James Cook. I research retail and real estate for JLL. And today we're digging deep into the whys and hows of turning retail buildings into industrial ones. Uh, this week we're also going live on YouTube. So if you're watching us on YouTube right now, feel free to type a question into the chat and we'll answer your questions later on in the show. So today we're gonna to be hearing from a lawyer who's gonna be telling us about the legal challenges of making that retail to industrial conversion. We're gonna be talking to the former VP of real estate at Bed Bath & Beyond to get the retailer's perspective. But first, we're gonna be joined by somebody who spends his whole life thinking about this stuff. And his name is Chris Bjornsson. Welcome, Chris, how are you doing today? Great, James, thanks for having me, appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, so Chris co-leads our retail industrial task force at JLL. He sits on the global retail board, he sits on the global industrial board. So Chris, um, you, I know you've been working with industrial occupiers for like something like 27 years. You've done, you work with a bunch of Fortune 500 clients doing big multi million square feet fulfillment centers and smaller last mile locations. So you're super close to the topic. So let's start simple. Why? Why are industrial occupiers thinking about converting retail space right now? Yeah, that's, that's a great question, James. And you think about what I'd consider a global shift from uh, bricks and mortar to e-commerce and the pandemic really emphasized that global shift for m many of us consumers, right? And so when we think about that global shift, we think about, just think about US and I'm talking United States only, just think about the urban planning of the US, right? It was retail in the center surrounded by residential and they put us industrial people do industrial way out far away from from the retail and the residential. Well, e-commerce has flipped that, right? The e-commerce models that we work on, even from the large fulfillment centers to the last mile facilities, is all about getting to that you know buyer density. How do we get to that buyer density? And and we as consumers have went went from wanting something as, as great as the hat that you have on in seven days to saying, hey, I've got a fashion, my daughter's fashion show tonight. I want that for tonight. That's changed the way as all of our clients have to serve um, the customer. So, you know, our thoughts as we approach these projects now is, you know, our clients are looking to solve not just location, location, location. It's logistics, logistics, location, right? So my, my ability to serve you this afternoon I have to be close to that population density and that buying density. So therefore, we are converting and focusing on the conversion 
of not just retail locations, but it's it's from parking lots to old class C manufacturing to anything that can get us into the right centroids to meet that service. Gotcha. And you, I know you work with a lot of, you know, the biggest retailers. Um, what are they saying? Here's what we want right now, Chris. Yeah. So everybody, as you think about this evolution, um, not everybody started on second base, right? So think about the evolution, even the fortune 500 clients that we work through, there's a diversification of what the fortune 10 is doing versus the fortune 100 versus the fortune 500. So everybody's at this different evolution of e-commerce adoption as it relates to customer responsiveness, as it relates to technology investment, as it relates to placement of inventory. So those large deals you talked about, the fulfillment centers, they're still happening. You know, So those large fulfillment centers are still happening, but the last mile is really where the focus has been lately. You know, Many of those last mile nodes now are you know 50,000 square feet to 150,000 square feet on you know on greater than five acres and you know they're really on the greater than five acres because it's more than just storage it's all about the parking and in the you know, track you know the types of vehicles that are getting it to your home when you want something you know uh, later this afternoon it's a whole different model so they're you know you're working with these clients you're looking for sites what are the kind of the specific things that they need for a site to work? Yeah, and I, I'll start sort of at, at the customer level. I mean, these customers are big brands and they're very sensitive about, you know, how their customers perceive them. And so, so there, there's always a sensitivity to proximity to residential. And when we're thinking about on the retail conversion side, you know, what's going on with the other retailers there. So they're very sensitive to how are they going to play what, what is now in sort of this, this, this denser urban market? Um, so that, that's number one. The second thing comes back to what's the transportation infrastructure to support this? If we got commitments to get something to someone in two hours, you know, how quickly and what's the map out that we do? So it used to be we'd be given an industrial project and they'd say Chicago. Well, well, Chicago is now down to the block. It's definitely down within the mile because every block and every mile matters um, for this. So it's definitely we have pinpoints throughout throughout markets that, that we're trying to hit. And within those pin park, you know, pinpoints, we're looking for some of those things that I mentioned, but but also gets in, you know, number one is, you know, coverage ratio. Now, how much building do we really need? But how much parking do we need? So that's a huge criteria. Then we get inside the building. It's less about clear height now, but typically for these retail conversions, we are adding a number of docks. We often have to do a sprinkler change. We need a little more a, a different lighting and we need a little more power. So there is changes that we're thinking about for every one of those retail assets, you know, from truck court setbacks to many of the things that we mentioned. In some cases, based on the flooring strategy and the automation strategy we have in the box, it could come down to floor depth and, and floor support as well. So there's a lot, a lot to think about. So Chris, uh, we're gonna circle back with you in just a little bit, but we're gonna move on to our next guest. And uh, our next guest is, uh, let me add him in here, Seth Geld Geldzoller. Seth, welcome, sir. How are you doing today? I'm great, James, thanks for, uh putting this together today. This is exciting. Yeah, this is awesome. I want to remind our viewers uh, that if you're on YouTube right now, you can type in questions in the chat and we will answer them when we get to the group discussion in just a little bit. Um, but first, I want to talk Seth one on one with Seth a little bit here. So if you guys don't know Seth, he's got 30 years plus experience. He did uh, 25 years at Bed Bath & Beyond. He was their VP of real estate. Um, he joined JLL, joined us here at JLL uh, earlier this year. Seth, you're here to talk to us from the retailer point of view as the insider. Uh, so um, let's see, what do I wanna ask you? What do they want? Like real simple, what do retailers care about? What's on their mind every day? Well, Chris, Chris, Chris mentioned some of the things, um, you know, wearing um, the hat that's, I guess, implanted on my head that I can never pull off, although I'm now on the industrial side. As a retailer, 
you know, you, 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 you're all about the customer. And for any of us that have um, shopped in supermarkets in the last year or, or well, maybe 18 months or a little before the last year, shopping the stores while they have people picking and pulling is not as convenient as possible. I know Gino talked about this on your last call that you did. And using the store was supposed to be a major solution, but it gets very complicated because you're impacting customers and, and picking and, and you're not being able to order appropriately. So now the focus is really ha has to be on how do we get that product to the customer in that last hour? Or actually, I just heard this morning, I've heard that I, somebody said 15 minutes is the new two hours. So uh, you're going to see people really doing as quickly as possible, you know, be as close to that a customer as you can. And as we've been saying, retail is where that commercial real estate is in the neighborhoods. Gotcha. So I'm a researcher. So I'm looking at things like average, average rents all the time. One thing I notice, average retail rents are a lot higher than average industrial rents. So can you justify, does it make economic sense to pay those higher rents for an industrial use? The, the question um, <laughs> and what the return is to, to the developers community as well. Um, interestingly, uh, we've seen a shift and the retail rents have obviously come down with uh, the perception of vacancy, whether it's there or not is perhaps another topic for you. Um, but industrial rents have gone crazy high. Um, and the delta is, is, very, is pretty close. And an example here in New Jersey that I just saw recently is um, a, an empty major big box department store, two levels. And on the ground floor, a uh, discount retailer that is known to pay low rents. So let's, uh, you know, single digit rents uh, took the ground floor and upstairs, another 95,000 feet, a uh, major online presence has a distribution facility that's their last mile. Um, and the rents actually are very similar. So, you know, when you see there's always bargain retailers out there paying bargain rents. And I think you're going to see industrial or non-retail uses um, that will certainly be able to pay up to those lower bargain rents. And so beyond finding rents that make economic sense, are there other challenges from the retailer's perspective that you've got to overcome to do something like this? So there's, there's you know, it, it's a global conversation or big, big topic, omni topic. Major shopping centers, major malls all have the convergence of, of, um, of uh, access and, and really make a lot of sense for this. And you're going to see more and more of that. Some we see being totally torn down and redeveloped for industrial space because of the, the proximity and the access. While there may be some um, uh, tax, uh, tax revenue loss, sales tax revenue loss in the community, there's a lot of jobs that come with a lot of these facilities. So uh, you're seeing towns that are willing to accept that. On the community center, it's gonna be much more difficult. You don't want big trucks constantly coming in and out of a community center that is uh, in the middle of a community where you have your residents. So the retailers that are existing in these centers, uh, the supermarket, the, 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 um, the, the pharmacy, um, all those, those local guys are going to be very sensitive to uses that one don't necessarily drive traffic to their stores and two that make it inconvenient for a customer to come in so that's one of the major concerns that we're seeing got it all right seth i have more questions but you're we're going to get to those in our group discussion so Great. we're going to say goodbye to seth for a minute and next up it's time to get the legal perspective so for that we've invited david rabinowitz welcome david how are you doing today i'm doing great james how are you and thank you very much for having me i'm, I'm awesome so david right. is joining us from new york he's a partner at goulston and stores over 30 years of experience his work is focused on retail and industrial development and leasing so David, we, we thought you were the perfect person to talk about this with us. Um, let's see, legal questions abound. I'm sure when you're doing this, what, what just simply big picture, what legal restrictions do you face 
when you're trying to take a retail building and convert it to an industrial use? Um, so there, there are, are challenges um, and lawyers like to point out what the issues are and what the problems are. Um, so I can certainly do that and we'll do that, but also try to come up with some solutions to those issues. Um, so if you think of these retail projects, or let's say a mall, it's, it's really a puzzle that was put together by a developer sometimes 50 years ago, 60 years ago. Um, and e each piece of that puzzle is an important piece. And it starts with the anchors who drove the deals years and years ago. And then you bring in zoning and the land use and you bring in the other the other retailers and um and you have this beautiful mosaic that was formed that was very functional until relative recent times and now it's not so functional so when you when you take a piece out of that puzzle so for instance if you're taking the department store out of that puzzle because it's no longer to be a department store and you're trying to make it something else it's not going to fit in exactly right and it's going to cause the other pieces to be adjusted. So one of the uh, one of the legal issues that comes up is when these developments were put together, uh, there were uh, site control provisions that were incorporated into documents. They can either be into the leases with the anchors, uh, or something called the reciprocal easement agreement, an REA. Um, an REA is a recorded document. Um, it's it's the best way to think of it. It's the constitution for this particular retail project. It tells you what you can do and what you can't do. It tells you who has the right to approve changes or, or modifications to that. It tells you where you can build and where you can't build. And it sets forth easements where you may need utility lines, you may need access. Um, and oftentimes uh, these REAs are, um, they're recorded, like I said, they have a fixed term. Some of those terms are actually coming up soon if they were done 50 or 60 years ago, but they're there. And typically the anchors along with the developer have approval rights. Um, so they can they can have the right to say, we don't, warehouse industrial would not be a permitted use under these documents. So these are private documents. We're gonna get the zoning in a minute. Um, so you're gonna have to get, the, get them on board in order to be able to change uh, them in order to permit the use, to permit a change in the footprint, uh, to permit different traffic flow, uh, to talk about different types of parking arrangements. Um, it's a whole cascading uh, um, uh, events that have to that you really have to take into account as you're trying to put put a new piece in this puzzle. Gotcha. Interesting. So a lot to think about. Is that when we talk about co-tenancy restrictions, is that different? That's that's to do with the lease, right? That's different yeah, that's, from the so REA. Co-tenancy restrictions, that's the next one, or one more in leases. And those are um, uh, basically provisions that retailers have negotiated for that give the retailer in the specific project the certain rights in the event certain named retailers are no longer operating for business um, or a certain critical mass of retailers are no longer operating for business um, in the center. So for instance, if, um, if you're in a mall and let's say uh, one of the co-tenants was um, a major department store, and that department store closes, uh, this provision <clears throat> excuse me, may enable the retailer to go on some sort of reduced rent for a period of time and perhaps also have the right to terminate at some point in time. Now the landlord might also have the right to terminate unless they go back to full rent after a certain period of time. Um, so by changing uh, the anchor to something different that's not a retail concept, uh, could uh, trigger these co-tenancy provisions, and that could trigger uh, less rent income uh, to the developer, to the landlord under the leases. So that's where, when people talk about co-tenancy, those are the types of provisions they're talking about. Gotcha. And then, I mean, I always think about zoning too. Does zoning often prohibit industrial uses in these retail places? Yeah, so zoning is part of that puzzle that I talked about. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, those are, restrictions imposed by law, uh, what you can do and what you can't do with the property, what you can build and what you can't build from, from, the, from the municipality or the government perspective as opposed to other private parties. Uh, so when the, um, the approvals were obtained for the project, which again could have been many, many years ago, uh, typically the, the approvals would set forth what the permitted uses would be. So it would be a retail use 
things that are ancillary to retail. And um, although it would depend on a specific set of approvals, I would be surprised to see industrial listed as a permitted use. So if it's not a permitted use, generally that means it's not a, it's, it's excluded. You can't do it unless you go back and get a change. Uh, so part of the conversation would be, I would encourage people to not use the word industrial um, and perhaps <laughs> use warehouse and distribution um, instead as they start talking about this and socializing it with others, especially at the municipality level, uh, because you're really not talking about manufacturing and, and that would have worse, a, a, worse, a worse impact than if you're talking about something different. Um, and then there's different strategies. So you're likely gonna have to go back um, you're unlikely to be able to get a, a variance or a waiver because this was not a permitted use to begin with. So you're likely going to have to either amend the existing zoning code and the zoning approvals uh, to permit this type of use, which would require probably a, a change in the ordinance. Uh, or another strategy we, we've come up with, um, which makes sense for larger redevelopments, not a just a single change, but a larger. So if you're taking them all, and you're turning it into something a lot different, like with hotels and a residential and industrial out here somewhere, uh, to do a zoning overlay district. So this would be a, a special district that you would form in conjunction with the town. You basically, you, you as a developer write the zoning code um, that gets adopted and that basically sets forth what you can do as a matter of right. The advantages of that is that you don't have to start applying for variances all the time. There's less of an appeal risk, but it takes a lot of time. So, that sounds like a lot. Is there anything we're missing? Are there other approvals or things that we haven't talked about yet? Um, so we're just we're just on the surface of all of this. Okay. Uh, <laughs> There's a reason I'm not a lawyer, David. This is too much for me already. <laughs> uh, no, you're you're very smart. Um, um, Seth, on the other hand, is a reform lawyer. Uh, he's even smarter uh, than both of us. Uh, so uh, you also. The developer will likely have a loan on the property mm. um, and we'll have various loan covenants uh, that uh, changing the project like this will likely trigger. Uh, so the developer is going to have to get its lender on board in terms of what it wants to do. Um, the rent stream is going to be different. The use is going to be different, whether it has impacts on the other leases. That's all the things that are going to be considered. And, you know, lenders are going to know who, who the end user is going to be. You know, that's what it's underwriting. Um, also, um, other parts of the, the capital stack. So if there's other equity investors in the project, if you have partners, if you have a mezzanine lender, uh, those are all likely you're going to have to go back and get their approval as well. Um, so if you're going to do a project like this, um, it's really important to do a lot of very good diligence up front uh, to find out, you know, where the issue, what the issues are. Um, when we talk about the zoning, it's important to find out what the political landscape is like. Uh, who are uh, potential objectors. Um, as I think Seth and Chris mentioned, if it's close to a residential area, that's probably going to be a prime source of objection. Um, and then uh, once you've identified, you know, what the landscape is like and, you know, which what approvals you need, then to come up with a thoughtful strategy of how to go out and obtain these. But, um, you know, this takes time. It's not something that's going to happen, you know, very, very quickly. All right. Well, David, while we've been talking, we've had questions come in. So I'm going to add in Chris and we're going to be rejoined by Seth as well. Welcome back, guys. Thank you. Hey, Jay. All right. So um, this is live. So uh, we're just going to pull up some questions here. Randy asks, how about the other retail restaurant tenants in the mall? This will lower foot traffic and sales. Oh, interesting. Will it? That's the big question, right? That is exactly the point. Um, if it's an empty box and it's been empty for a long time, at least you'll have some employees in the in this project now that weren't there before. So, um, you know, I, I think that it is uh, an opportunity for discussion. And David, you know, did you spoke very clearly about all of the potential um, lease issues and things that that are going to come up. And one thing that we've uh, been reminded of in the pandemic is that everybody wants something um, and every tenant, so your the restaurants, they're all gonna look for something and flexibility as well. So it's an opportunity to have a conversation and the foot traffic need can be addressed, but they may want to be able to have more sidewalks use. And so the landlord can offer that in trade for these. So you're gonna see a lot of trading 
continuing to go on. And the, the most, the most cost effective way to do that is really, you know, is for the logistics operators, um, fulfillment companies to really be loading trucks at night and releasing mm -hmm. trucks before the retail traffic ever comes. So the optimal way is to have a multi-stop truck making all kinds of stops throughout the day to get you the product when you want. And so, you know, what we're working on is sort of what's the synergy between the retail operating environment today versus what really needs to happen to be a cost effective fulfillment operation there. And so we're seeing that synergy and not as much overlap. And so we're hoping that works for everybody. I'd also make the following observation when we're thinking about this type of conversion, um, um, you know, more so when it's conversion of a part of a project as opposed to just demolishing a center and um, putting an industrial. And, you know, if you think about, you know, the malls over the years, there were traditional mall tenants. And um, over time, when the big box retailers started coming on board and Seth knows, knows this, um, you know, that put a lot of stress and pressure on department stores. And you started seeing big box tenants going into malls, which was now it sounds like, oh, OK, no big deal. But back then it was a big thing. You know, the questions are, you know, would that big box retailer open into the mall or not? Generally, they, they didn't need to. They would want an exterior entrance. You know, they want people with shopping carts. The mall, the mall tenants really don't use their shopping carts outside into the parking lot. I mean, they brought up a lot of a lot of different issues. And then as time went on and pre-pandemic, you know, the discussion was, well, how do we densify these projects? Because um, because they were challenged. The department stores, even pre-pandemic, were having a lot of issues. Um, and and developers started thinking about okay, it's densified by bringing in other types of non-retail uses. So they started talking to hospitality users and, and multifamily um, hospitals and, and, edu and educational institutions and bringing them into the mall either by building up or building on an out parcel. And who would have thought of that? I mean, that was like, this is crazy. This is, you know, how does that add to the, to the, to the foot traffic in the mall? Um, so, you know, I understand warehouse, industrial, whatever we're going to call it, is 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 further away from the retail than the re than the other uses are, <clears throat> but it's it's just an evolution of you know you have a you have good real estate, um, and you have excess real estate, and you know how can um, how can we we the real estate community use that in a way that's good for society, and if developers are one thing, they are optimists. And they are doers and creative and retailers as well and can figure out how to put the puzzle back together again. You know, David, you reminded me of, um, uh, you know, the, the, the big boxes coming in. And I think the warehouse clubs, Costco, BJ and uh, BJ's and um, Sam's Club and some of the others have paved the way for this. You know, they first showed up as warehouse use and not retail. And it was a hybrid that many municipalities and, and people had to, to learn to live with. And I think that we're, we're there's a lot that's been uh, you know paved in front of us already for that. I think that uh, we have to remind ourselves, as David said, to not use the word industrial and talk about distribution and just it's the next step. Well, we got a suggestion in from uh, Jason, Jason Kirkham, uh, who told us we should use the term last mile fulfillment. I was thinking, just call e-commerce. We're going to put an e-commerce store in the mall, you know, that's because that's what it is, right? Yep. Yep. I guess. But, well, listen, retailers are using the word Omni and, and and not worrying about what what it's called and just knowing that it is fulfillment. So we could just call it fulfillment. It doesn't have to be last mile. Yeah. It looks like Jason also had a question for you, Chris. The labor needs of e-com and retail seem very different. Oh, that's a good point. Thoughts? Uh, different labor pools. Yeah, a little bit different labor pools, but you know, as this evolution is going, um, you know, the good thing is where the locations we're focusing on last mile, there's labor density, and so with labor density, you you, you have the ability to fill not only the retail jobs that used to be there, but also the fulfillment jobs uh, that are there. And you know, what we're seeing is 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 much of a more uh, performance driven pay structure in the fulfillment world. So versus a static pay situation in the retail world, you know, these jobs and, and there's a number of these fortune 10 retailers that are driving it 
these jobs are, are quickly escalating into very good paying jobs. You know, you move outside of the warehouse and now you're in the delivery business. Um, you know, you quickly have multiple options to make all ranges of different money than, than retail stores typically provide it. And your van drivers are customer facing and there's an importance in that respect as well. It's a lot, there is a lot of overlap that is maybe overlooked. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Um, you can really, yeah, the incomes that warehouse workers are making now are really competitive compared to a retail associate. That's a great point. Okay, we've got a question here from Sanjeev. Saw one retail change to industrial in Naperville. So that's your neck of the woods, right, Chris? Yep. Um, the city insisted on the facade to still look like retail. Do you guys see that a lot? Yes. So uh, I've seen, um, and it could be one of, it could be the same thing. Some of the grocery stores have gone into dark stores that are still providing. Um, so they have a box that they have a lease on. So they're using it, but they're not taking customers there. But the town wants it to look uh, like it's part of this shopping center that, 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 um, that they've approved. Uh, the other piece that I've seen is some of these dark store guys are, being very community oriented and hiring local artists to do murals on these these buildings that are done locally and community based and and really becoming a part of the community so that it's a canvas that can be changed from time to time so i think that there's there are opportunities that we're going to see so that might be one part of the strategy when you're starting to talk and socialize this with the municipality or some of the governmental officials you know to think about these types of um, amenities uh, uh, if you call it that, uh, as part of the project. Now, it's probably going to increase the cost of construction, uh, but if that's a you know if that's a uh, an okay price to pay in terms of getting them on board with the project, then it might be worthwhile. It makes me think of uh, we used to talk a lot about this idea of form-based zoning, where it doesn't matter what the use is; it just all has to look a certain way. Because you know, I guess aesthetics are more important than use. Um, oh man. People are really involved here. We got a bunch of questions. I hope we can get there, all of them. So does anyone have any insights on how an e-commerce company's sales per square foot in a warehouse compare to retail sales per square foot? It's an interesting question. I don't know enough about, Chris, do you even think about sales per square foot when you're talking about industrial space? Is that something a metric people think about? You know, it's mostly coming back through throughput, right? And, you know, I, I think that question is more related to tax dollars, right? So typically we, we have to get into an explanation of, you know, if it's not retail oriented sales, it's creating a tax revenue. And then what would this operation create from a tax revenue? And as you know, every state, you know, is a little bit different on their e-commerce sales tax. Every state's different on their employment tax because these centers will have much more employment. And so, uh, you know, I, I think there's the measure, the relative measure comes back usually in a tax basis question. And uh, Alex, I didn't ask Alex to set this question up, by the way, but this is my, <laughs> my, my big soapbox, as David knows, that sales per square foot is, is a metric that's used by you know, landlords, lenders, um, and, and it comes up all the time in percentage rent clauses and things. To me, it's it is beyond antiquated, and it it is not appropriate. And at this point, there has to be another way to measure the store's performance. So I think that, um, in a way, Alex is saying that as as things move away from uh, a, a traditional walk through the aisle, pick it up, and pay for it at the register, what's considered a sale through the front door of that building, and and that's an area that needs a lot of attention. So when uh, folks were registering, they were able to ask questions in advance. So I have a bunch of those too. There's one that I liked. Uh, I am convinced there are a lot fewer dark retail stores out there that are appropriate for industrial slash logistics than people think that there are. What is the consensus on that thought? Are there fewer out there than people think? Any thoughts? Well, let, let's just look at, you know, where we're at the state of the industrial market today, James, right? So most markets are less than 5% vacancy. Where we mm -hmm. want to be for these facilities is less than 1% industrial vacancy, right? So um, our thoughts, you know, JLL's come back and said, hey, by 2025, there'll be 1 billion square feet of industrial deals done. 
Um, we believe, you know, within the retail industrial task force that, that Seth and I sit on, you know, that, that at least 5% of that 1 billion at, on the low side, in our opinion, will be retail conversions. Um, because we know how sensitive it is for our clients to be there. And so our, our clients will first go through which stores are not performing. Can we make a dark store? And when they say we can't make a dark store in the area we want to be, that's when they pass us the ball. When they pass us the ball, they expect us to be real estate agnostic. They don't care if we're finding an industrial location or a retail location to be converted or a parking lot or anything we find to create that need of fulfillment at that exact location. So, uh, you know, we strongly believe that, you know, that there's going to be more than we think. If we take away some of the constraints that David was making, it, it certainly, you know, given the ratio, parking ratios and stuff, you know, we well exceed that 5% number to meet it through the retail conversion process. And if we call industrial, if we stop calling it industrial and call it fulfillment, as we were talking about, you're seeing 3,000 square foot boxes being used for last mile for, uh, you know, I think um, uh, GoPuff, for example, you'll see, and I know, I think James, you've talked about it on some other calls. They're coming in, they have nobody going in the front door but they're using retail because of its location. So I, I think it's a much broader area. And uh, if nothing else, anybody walks away from it, we shouldn't be using the word industrial for some of this. <laughs> okay, well, here's a question about a business model. Uh, what about one company taking on empty anchor, taking on the anchor, leasing it out, and then managing the warehousing for multiple retailers in one building? Have you guys seen anybody try that? Well, you know, let, let's go through a global platform, right? So the global platform, that's happening all day in EMEA, right? So 3PL adoption for what I'd call Fortune 500 and beyond retail concepts in EMEA, the 3PLs are, are doing that. Um, Asia Pack, a little bit different. Asia Pack's already evolved to the multi-channel facility at the retail location itself. So many of those Asia Pack facilities are, you know, 60% showroom, 40% fulfillment. Um, so it's a totally different model. So yeah, we, I truly believe it'll eventually come here in the US just the same way. Uh, but we're probably five years behind on that process right now, uh, US versus what we're seeing in EMEA. We are hearing some major developers from centers so that there can be that. We haven't seen it. I haven't seen it or uh, successfully done yet, but I think it's just a matter of time as Chris said. Gotcha. Okay, so we've got another question coming in. Uh, this one was submitted by a viewer via email. Okay, it seems like industrial tenants want space that is available in the near term and are not willing to wait for entitlements and retrofits. <laughs> okay, this is interesting. Are retail owners having to pursue conversion on spec in order to create leasable, marketable space? So is anybody doing this on spec? Yeah, it's starting. It's starting. Yeah. Yeah, so, so it's beginning. Um, but, but you know, many of the people that are thinking about this conversion right now are, are, are sort of avoiding some of those things that David talked about, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, what is the REA? Or has there been a different prior use of zoning that wasn't always retail? I mean, what's the adjacent use? So, you know, people are taking the path of least resistance right now to meet the demand in the market. Uh, but I truly believe if you, if you need to be in the right location, um, the communities are going to start coming with you. Us consumers have already got there. Mm -hmm. um, the retailers have got there with us. And now we need the local governments to really sort of get up to speed, too, because it's an evolution that, that I believe is here to stay. So if I were a, um, an owner of this type of property, um, I would... Um, and I and there were dark space where were excess space for that property. Um, you know, I would give Chris a call and talk to Chris and Seth um, about you know likely uses for that space. And then I I think it would be worthwhile to start doing your own diligence, even if you have so it's not you're not building anything on spec, but at least you're understanding what the potential issues are and who, who you need to get on board for your specific project. So that. That saves some time right there once you have that understanding. And then after talking with Chris and Seth you, and figuring out, okay, is there someone real or not, then you can map out a strategy for how far you want to go before you have 
somebody tied up. Um, you know, there's always that, you know, that pursuit cost in there, if you will, and how much you want to spend on that. But I think that would be worthwhile because the chances are, even if it's not industrial, you're going to have to do something with that space. So you're going to need an understanding of what your property is, is like anyway uh, and what, what constraints there are. And, um, you know, I will say for, for better or for worse, and it's probably for worse for these types of projects um, and without criticizing uh, municipalities, you know, they're, they're typically hard to bring along in terms of having a vision of, of what's happening right now. You know, they have retail set in their minds and they want this exciting retail project with these luxury retailers and these great restaurants and this thriving town center kind of place. And, um, and, you know, you really have to bring them along and you, you need a vision and you need someone to sell that vision, um, which is something that developers are quite good at doing once they get on board with that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great, that's a great point. Um, so, uh, other questions that we got in, uh, one person asked, is there, are there some examples, real life examples we can talk about, or is it still, this, this seems like such a long process. It seems like most of these are just happening now and haven't really come to fruition yet. Is that, is that true? Seth, you're on mute. I think you have I, 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 I do have an answer, but I also I can't help this. I can't make this up. They're actually jackhammering right above me. This so is Chris, live TV. Might, I know. So Chris, you might want to give that answer though. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so so this is happening, you know. So yeah, so you know, James, you know, this Seth gave a great example in the New Jersey market, right? Where where, where there's co-tenancy, you know, you know, in a large center like that. So this is happening, you know, and, and communities are coming along. Um, as I said, I, I said there's a different adoption rate between the Fortune 10, you know, which we hear all about. And those are the ones that are, that are making those plays now. Fortune 200 is not far behind and Fortune 500 is a little bit farther behind. So different adoption rate. And as that adoption rate comes up to speed, no different than the EMEA example where three PLs are now, now involved in a shopping mall center. Um, you know, you're going to see more and more of this. So, so Chris was using the word co-tenancy different than I was. So Chris was using it as way of different types of uses coexisting uh, together in the center, as opposed to the co-tenancy type of provisions that we were talking about before James, which may restrict things. Gotcha. Gotcha. So uh, as we're wrapping up here, uh, it sounds like <laughs> the construction is moving along at Seth's apartment. Oh man, I love it. You know, I, this is this is this is just how it goes. It's just live television, guys. This is how it goes. Um, it just it seems like there's a lot of opportunity here for this. So like in summation, like if you own a retail property uh, that's long in the tooth, it seems like you should at least be considering this strongly, right? Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Um, awesome. So guys, I want to thank you all for joining me today. Um, and we're going to do some more conversations like this on this YouTube channel coming at the, up in the future. So thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having thank me. Thank you, James. Yep. All right. And uh, for those of you out there uh, listening or watching right now, do us a favor. If you liked the podcast that you heard or watched today, tell a friend to check it out. Let them know they can subscribe to Where We Buy. Just go to, I, I like to use Spotify, but a lot of people use the Apple Podcast app. Just go in there and search for Where We Buy and hit subscribe and you get a new interview in your phone almost every week. You can also stream us on the web at wherewebuy.show. Um, and if you want more talk about retail, retail tech, retail trends, we've got a weekly live show every Thursday at noon Eastern, and it's called Everything We Know About Retail. If you're watching us on YouTube, it's the thing you're watching now. Just subscribe to it and you'll get all the good stuff. Or uh, if you're listening right now, open up a web browser and go to everythingweknow.show and that will take you uh, to the YouTube channel where you can hit subscribe and uh, check it out every week. As I mentioned, we've got more industrial and retail shows coming soon. We're all over this trend of the convergence 
of industrial and retail, and we've been thinking about it quite a bit, and we want to cover more of it. Um, thanks to all of you for viewing us live or joining us on the replay. And as I always say at the end of our podcast, our theme music is Run in the Night by the Good Lords under Creative Commons license. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.